and welcome to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. Each year, the prestigious Beverly Alt Scholarship provides senior fellows at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre in Sydney an opportunity to enrich their educational and career training activities. This fellowship honours the life of Beverly Alt and the compassionate care she received at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. As such, our very own Dr. Josh Hurwitz abandoned me to go gallivanting in the United States of America. He was able to attend the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in Texas, as well as engage with some of the brightest minds in cancer care and research at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Meanwhile, I was left to freeze in one of the coldest Australian summers on records. No, I'm not bitter. Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, supported by the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and the Beverly Alt Scholarship, is incredibly honoured to present a series of interviews with specialists who have influenced the course of medical oncology on both a global and personal scale, providing the promise of innovative, personalised medicine. In this episode, Josh interviews Dr. Harold Burstein. A graduate of Harvard University and Harvard Medical School, Dr. Burstein's initial PhD was in cellular immunology. He received his oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and joined the staff there in 1999. He has a special interest in breast cancer and has led and participated in national and international clinical trials while also working to develop treatment guidelines in use across the world. He also has a passion for education, teaching medical students, residents and fellows both at Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber Institute. Hal, thanks so much for being on the show. Delighted to be with you. And I. So I think the first part of our conversation, I'd love to take you back in time a little bit to what led you to doing medicine, PhD, and ending up in medical oncology at a time where, you know, you didn't really have immunology or CDKs or any advanced medications apart from, you know, chemotherapy. The dark ages. We barely had electricity back then. (laughs) Um, Well, um, I came from a family of physicians. My grandfathers were both physicians and my father and uncle were physicians. And um, when I went to college, I always assumed I would be a pre-med and likely go into medicine, which I did. Um, But while I was in college, uh, I got a couple good pieces of advice there was a legendary physician here at Dana-Farber named David Livingston, who was what they call my tutor in biochemistry at Harvard College back in the day. And um, at the time, there was a brand new course opening up on um, molecular biology being taught by two uh, very famous scholars now, uh, Doug Melton and Tom Maniatis. And he said, go take that course. They just, they just opened it last year. And um, that was a very exciting moment. Um, We were learning about uh, genes and their function and biology, and it led me to work in the lab of Professor Tom Maniatis as an undergraduate uh, with a postdoctoral fellow. And that really changed the trajectory of my career from being focused simply on becoming a physician to uh, being interested in uh, academic medicine. And with that background, I applied for MD-PhD programs and um, was very fortunate to get an offer uh, here at Boston uh, in the Harvard-MIT Health Science and Technology program and the NDMD PhD program at HMS. Um, so from there, I um, I went into immunology because we had these incredible instructors, um, including Professor Abul Abbas, who was here at the Brigham and Women's at the time, and uh, I went and joined his lab, which was studying cellular immunology. And I liked immunology because it was real experimentally based. So there was a history to immunology. There were classic experiments that had proven one point or another, and it wasn't simply cataloging information, uh, which uh, was emerging at that point. Now, of course, that may not have been the greatest strategic decision, but there was this huge cataloging effort going on of cell types and of biomarkers and things. But um, I actually like the experimental part of it and really enjoyed doing the experiments. Uh, we studied mouse immunology and I looked at the role of cytokines and B cells and T cells and uh, how they both activated and then sort of turned off immune responses and uh, some models of what was called energy at the time. It was sort of a, uh, immune suppression, if you will. Um, so I love the work in the lab. Uh, But one of the things I learned in the lab is that I really wasn't meant to be a full-time bench (laughs) investigator. Um, uh, I loved the people and I had a great time doing the experiments, but um, I was excited to wrap up my my PhD work and and return to clinical medicine. Uh, So I went over to Mass General where I uh, did internal medicine and then um, was very fortunate to land a fellowship spot in medical oncology at Dana-Farber. And I've been here since then uh, when I came as a fellow in uh, 1996. And in America, you have 
countless choices of incredible fellowships, you know, across the board. You've got Dana Farber, you've got Yale, you've got lots of other great oncology programs. What made you choose Dana Farber? Well, I mean, the Farber was um, even back in the 1990s renowned as the preeminent training place for medical oncology in the United States. Um, and it had some incredible people, people who became lifelong mentors of mine, uh, George Canellis, Bob Mayer, who I still work with to this day. Um, and um, I had done, uh, as I mentioned, a PhD in immunology. There was this tremendous group of immunology investigators over at Dana-Farber who um, I thought might provide translational opportunities. Uh, and um, uh, so it was really the, the cream of the crop, if you will, in terms of choices. Um, and then, you know, as you age, uh, by then, uh, my girlfriend, now spouse of many years, um, <laughs> was here in Boston. She was also training in medicine in Boston at the time. And um, uh, we knew that Boston would be a place we would be very happy as a family. Fair enough. And, you know, you chose oncology. And one of the things to say, Im uh, immunotherapy has been a bit of a late addition to breast cancer itself. So how did you end up in the breast cancer world? Bob Mayer does predominantly GI cancers or gastrointestinal type cancers. How did you end up in this subspecialty? Yeah. So um, when I went into internal medicine, you know, I knew I wanted a science-based profession. And so I looked around at rheumatology and infectious disease and, and oncology. And my wife was going into cardiology, so I wanted to leave that uh, <laughs> to them. Um, but oncology always appealed uh, for several reasons. One is that you know, when a patient has a cancer diagnosis, it becomes a, a huge part of their lives in a way that perhaps not all medical diagnoses do. And I enjoyed the intensity of that. It also it gave the opportunity to be um, not quite a primary care provider, but to really look at the whole patient uh, as well as your more focused, narrow uh, specialty interest. And I knew that I could use the science I'd acquired in medical school and graduate school and, and before uh, to really inform the care of patients. And I think, you know, I've ended up with a very clinically oriented career, but the science behind it is something I've always cherished. And I think it helps to understand enough science that you can explain it to patients because it's a lot easier to understand why you're getting this or that if you can explain that science. Very, very true. What's your current role here at Dana-Farber? Well, I'm first and foremost a clinician. I see patients about half the time here uh, and run a very busy breast cancer practice, taking care of the full spectrum of breast cancer from early stage disease to advanced disease and um, obviously everything in between. And we have just an amazing group of colleagues to work with in medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgical oncology, and all the related specialties that support our patients. So um, that's, you know, the biggest part of what I do. Um, over the years, I've done a lot of clinical trials in the breast cancer space. Um, I'm our grant holder for our uh, NCI-sponsored cooperative group grant, which is the grant that supports the activities of NCI-led trials at the center. All the major cancer centers would have a similar grant. Um, and, um, uh, and so that's the clinical research part that I still focus on a lot. Um, I do a lot of teaching. I teach at uh, Harvard Medical School. We run several programs specifically for medical students. We also work with our fellows uh, and work with them on developing their professional skills and obviously talking about breast cancer. And finally, as it happens, I'm president of the medical staff right now and um, uh, co-chair of the clinical faculty council. So I do some work um, trying to ease operations and uh, help our faculty across the board um, make their way in the complicated medical world. So it seems you sleep less than uh, you probably should. Oh, I sleep okay. <laughs> <laughs> so going back just a little bit, you mentioned NCI grants, which while we don't have them in Australia, they're quite important <clears throat> and I guess fundamental to probably oncology and a lot of research. Can you tell me a little bit more about the importance of NCI grants across the board? Well, the uh, National Cancer Institute and more largely the National Institute of Health of the United States is a really important organization for um, sustaining in the cancer space, several types of work. One is um, basic science laboratory research. So uh, many of our renowned laboratory investigators will have extensive portfolios of NIH grants. Um, these grants obviously give tremendous academic freedom to investigators. They also come with substantial what are called indirect costs, which supports the institution. So 
in addition to supporting the personnel in the lab uh, and the materials in the lab, be it experimental uh, test tubes or mice or whatever else you need to do your experiments, um, it also supports the operational side of doing clinic of doing research, you know, equipment like refrigerators and centrifuges and uh, paying the electrical bills and the support pieces that go into running a, a major cancer center. So those are, are much sought after, highly competitive grants, but um, a, a valuable part of any um, laboratory investigator work. Um, then there are training grants. So our fellowship program, which has 16 fellows a year, uh, is supported in large part by what's called a T32 training grant. Uh, and that covers the salaries of about half of our uh, clinical fellows um, and um, um, has been going on for I don't know, close to 50 years at Dana-Farber. Um, and then there are other kinds of grants that are more specialized. So um, there are so-called SPOR grants, specialized programs of research excellence. Many of our disease programs at Dana-Farber, including our breast cancer program and our GU program and our leukemia program, will have a SPOR grant. And these are large grants that give tremendous discretion to the SPOR leader in terms of which projects they fund. And they can often be used as sort of seed money for doing translational science work or uh, blending, ideally, laboratory and clinical experiments. That's really the goal of these SPORE grants. So those are uh, a much sought after uh, grant support as well. Um, the one we alluded to a moment ago is called um, a U10 grant, which is a grant specifically designed to support operations of NCI cooperative groups. So. Uh, here in the U.S., we are very fortunate to have a standing platform from the federal government of major cooperative groups that connect to all the academic centers, but also connect to community oncology programs, um, smaller individual sites, rural health centers, and places like that. And there is a process by which, at the national level, protocols are activated and then disseminated for accrual at all of these different kinds of clinics, ranging from, again, city academic centers to rural health clinics. Um, and there are grants to support that work, which uh, is the one that I work on mostly uh, here at the Farber. Wow, having a national platform to kind of disseminate trials and protocols is a wonderful way of It's really important. Care. And, um, you know, as pharma has gotten very sophisticated about doing global phase three and other types of clinical trials with new products they want to bring to market. Um, the NIH, the NCI grants and studies have been vital for a couple of things that those studies tend not to address. Um, they tend not to address topics in multidisciplinary care. So if you want to do a surgical study or a radiation oncology study, it's often very difficult to get pharma to support those kinds of things. And so we lean heavily on federal support for those. And you were just at the San Antonio meeting, so you know there are many important trials that have come forward in surgery, radiation treatment, and um, those were many of those were funded by the NCI. Um, the second would be um, comparative studies. So you know companies often don't like to do studies to compare one drug versus another drug. It, they like to see where their drug will shine most, and um, NCI will often do comparator studies to um, support which strategy would be best. Um, they also tend to support things like survivorship studies or quality of life interventions or um, other registry platforms to see how patients are faring, which, again, you know, historically are outside the purview of many um, uh, discovery-based um, uh, grants or other approaches. I love what you just said, because this coming on the, off the back of San Antonio, there's been a number of quite interesting publications, most of them sponsor driven and i'd love to dig a little bit deeper and get your thoughts on these trials some will relate to australia some will be more an international focus purely from accessibility but the first question i'd like to talk about is the emerald trial and for those that don't know emerald is elicestrant which targets the esr mutant in those with hormone receptor positive breast cancer and they released some updated data or they, they talked about it potentially. Maybe it was just at ESMO. I, uh, they, were, they were quite close, so I, I can see your look, your look. And I'd love to get your take on this drug in the context of what the PFS showed and also where it might actually fit in from a clinician perspective for this subset of patients. Yeah. So the first thing to say is that ls is a new class of drugs in the anti-estrogen space a so-called SIRD, a selective estrogen receptor degrader. Now, we already use a SIRD, the drug fulvestrant is a SIRD, 
These are drugs that bind to the estrogen receptor and take advantage of the cell cycle machinery to then have that protein degraded. Um, so along with tamoxifen, which is a SERM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which sort of interferes with estrogen's ability to stimulate the estrogen receptor, we have SERDs, like fulvestrant or elisestrant, and then the other major class of antiestrogens that we use in modern ma management of breast cancer would be the aromatase inhibitors, drugs that work by estrogen deprivation. So there are three different kinds of approaches here. And the last one to get approved before elisestrant was um, fulvestrant, which is like 15 or 18 or more years ago. I'd have to look up the exact. But the point is it'd been like decades almost since we'd had a new antiestrogen targeted drug. So there are multiple SERDs in development. These are orally available drugs. Uh, multiple companies are developing them. We do not know how many will get to market, and at the moment we do not know which of these approaches will be most effective. Elisestrant uh, was the first one to get a successful label, and it was studied in the Emerald trial, as you just said, and the comparison was against a dealer's choice of endocrine therapy, either a fulvestrant or an aromatase inhibitor, versus elisestrant for women who'd had previously treated ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. These are hard studies to do because if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, about half the patients have tumors that by now are really resistant to endocrine therapy. So they rapidly progress. And those experiences, those patient experiences become um, not uninformative, but they sort of dilute out the benefits of endocrine therapy because the tumor really isn't going to be sensitive. And then there's sort of a, an inflection point, and then there's a fraction of cancers where there's still sensitivity to more hormonal therapy. And particularly in that group, what we saw with the elisestrant was that it outperformed our other existing options of fulvestrant or an aromatase inhibitor, especially in those tumors that had an ESR1 mutation. So this audience may know already, but mutations in the e estrogen receptor, so-called ESR1 mutations, are one of the important contributors to resistance to hormonal therapy. These are mutations that turn the estrogen receptor on even in the absence of estrogen. I tell patients it's like you've hit the gas pedal and now the gas pedal is sort of stuck to the floor like it was taped down and the car is just accelerating forward even though you've taken your foot off the gas uh, because that pedal is is planted down. I assume they have engines and cars and things like that in Australia. Is yeah, that, it came do? last year. So we're, we're yeah, it came last excited. year. Yeah, exactly. Everyone else is getting there by boat, I suppose. Uh, but um, so the estrogen receptor is on but you can still target it for degradation. And that's what, in the uh, Emerald study, it was shown that elisestrant could uh, outperform our, our other options. Okay. And compared to, I guess, the standard care in Australia, first line for metastatic after CDK4-6 is generally capecitabine, you know, chemotherapy agent. Where would you sequence this? And for 50% of the population that's inherently going to be resistant, how do you identify the, the correct population? Well, these are really um, tr important and uh, tricky questions now because two things have happened in the past decade. Uh, one is that we have these new antiestrogens that we've just been discussing, but we also have seen the emergence of multiple targeted drugs, which we partner with antiestrogen medicines and have been shown to make the antiestrogen treatments more effective to allow them to control the cancer for longer. So we have CDK4-6 inhibitors, we have PI3 kinase inhibitors, we have now AKT inhibitors, we have older mTOR inhibitors. And um, what used to be a fairly simple algorithm of you give an aromatase inhibitor and then you give fulvestrant and then you might loop back to some older treatments like tamoxifen or megase or other drugs has now become really complicated because um, we have multiple lines of treatment options. We have very little head-to-head -head data. We have some data that you can partner the targeted therapies with certain antiestrogens, but so far not with all of them. And so uh, the elegance of this simple guidance is breaking down. So in summary, it's a complex field and there's not a, there's not a one. Well, it's a, you know, I think you can try and make some summaries of it, but it's, it's a surprisingly complex field. Uh, in the U.S., most patients who develop metastatic breast cancer, ER positive metastatic breast cancer, have already had um, either tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor in the adjuvant setting. Undoubtedly true in Australia and Western Europe as well, where widespread screening programs mean there's a lot of early stage breast cancer detected. Patients get adjuvant endocrine therapy, and then if they recur, the tumor is presumably somewhat resistant to those first line options. So for such patients as those, 
Fulvestrant would be our typical first-line treatment, usually partnered with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And then if they progress on that again, then you would think about either Elicestrant, if there's an ESR1 mutation, or a PIK3CA inhibitor-based therapy. That requires um, uh, also requires genomic testing. So the key caveat there is after first-line therapy, and sometimes even before, we're getting uh, tumor genomic sequencing on the vast majority of our cases of ER-positive metastatic disease. That algorithm looks a little different than the patient who has de novo metastatic disease or has not had adjuvant therapy in a long time, where an AI plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor would be standard, then fulvestrant, perhaps with um, uh, one of the targeted agents, or if there's an ESR1 mutation, perhaps uh, using elicestrant. You were at San Antonio, you know, we saw another approach just articulated, which was a triplet combination of an ovalisib, another PI3 kinase inhibitor, plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor, plus fulvestrant. Uh, two weeks ago, the US FDA approved capivacertib, an AKT inhibitor, uh, in the space of PIK3CA mutated tumors. Um, so there's a lot happening, and the expectation is there'll be more in the next few months to years as more um, SIRDs make their way into the market. And I think um, we're all going to be watching for that. I think one of the big questions is, will the SIRDs have, uh, the oral SIRDs have supplemental beneficial activity above and beyond fulvestrant in the ESR wild type uh, tumors instead of just the ESR mutated tumors? That's something we'll be looking for with a lot of interest. So precision medicine is the name of the game, like many of the specialties we're dealing with. Moving on, because I think I could pick your brain all day. <laughs> but the SONIA trial, and the SONIA trial I don't think was presented at San Antonio, but it was definitely presented at ESMO. And it looked at sequencing of the CDK46 palpocycler, which in Australia has lost a bit of favor just based on some data, versus commencing with an aromatase inhibitor or you know, um, in the, the first line setting of a metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And they showed from memory, there wasn't a huge difference between having CDK4-6 first or kind of sequencing a little bit later. And they talked about the financial benefits and potentially the toxicity benefit for the patient. While this is a trial of Europe and it doesn't encompass, I guess, a wider audience, do you see, again, sequencing, which is kind of the theme that I'm going with here, or the role of kind of rationalizing for patients sort of coming into our our clinics in the near future? Well, the real issue you're alluding to is the fact that most patients with metastatic breast cancer will get multiple lines of therapy. And for ER positive, that will usually include two or three lines of endocrine-based therapy and then four to six lines of chemotherapy on the backside. That chemotherapy regimens nowadays might include an antibody drug conjugate. For HER2-positive breast cancer, we know that most patients with metastatic disease are getting something on the order of seven to 10 lines of therapy. Even for triple negative breast cancer, which tends to have a faster pace of progression, most patients will get three or four lines of treatment. And so when you're in a situation where you've got all these new drugs entering the treatment algorithms, the questions quickly become not just, is that drug useful, but is there a rationale for using that drug earlier in the course of the sequence rather than later in the course of the sequence? And um, those are things that are often hard to know and, and require a lot of study because once the drug is in the marketplace, um, you know, the, as I say, the, the question isn't, you know, are you going to get it? The question is, when's the optimal time to use it? And that often reflects the side effect profile of the drug, um, the convenience factor of the drug. A lot of these hormonal therapies are oral. A uh, patient can travel with it. It doesn't require coming into the clinic once a week for IV chemotherapy. It doesn't have the side effects that patients are familiar with with chemotherapy, nausea and low blood counts to the same degree, and hair loss. All the things can make, all of which could, can make the experience of getting treated for advanced breast cancer really hard. So. Um, the SONIA study was a very interesting study. It was actually paid for by the Dutch government in the Netherlands because they actually wanted to see if there was an economic benefit to using a aromatase inhibitor first and then at progression adding a CDK4-6 inhibitor to fulvestrant or whether there was actually an advantage to giving the aromatase inhibitor plus the CDK4-6 inhibitor first and then the fulvestrant alone second. And the real endpoint of the study was the time to the second progression. And I got to say, I think this is a very important way to think about how we're dealing with a lot of uh, breast cancer drugs that are emerging these days. 
what they showed in that study was that um, palbociclib was effective in the first line. It had a hazard ratio of about 0.6, exactly as in all the other studies of, of palbociclib and CDK4-6-based inhibitor therapy. But then if you offered it in second line, you essentially neutralized the difference in the ultimate time to progression on an AI fulvestrant and a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And there was uh, no difference in overall survival. Um, so it's a very important study, which Americans have largely ignored. Uh, and the question is, why have they ignored it? And I think for a couple reasons. One is that um, there is a perception that CDK4-6 inhibitors are a very powerful class of drug, that they can improve survival in some instances when used in first or second line therapy. Uh, and that you know they allow patients a very long arc of time where a reasonably tolerable combination of drugs is given and it's very portable and all those things. Um, the second reason, I think, is that we alluded to the combinations with targeted treatment, and I think many American investigators and experts would say, well, we have so many options now with CDK4-6, PIK3CA, um, uh, mTOR inhibitors, opportunities to use LSSTRANT or other SIRDs that are coming along. We, we don't want to use all that space up front without a targeted drug. And um, I think there's some rationale for that. And finally, of course, it was a carefully selected group of patients who had not really had a lot of aromatase inhibitor treatment in the past, so they don't look like many of our patients who progress on or recently after an AI. Um, but it, you know, the other thing that study shows is how difficult it is to change practice once a habit has become um, uh, entrained in a clinical oncology community. So for instance, look at the studies of adjuvant trastuzumab. So as you know, the canonical studies used one year of adjuvant trastuzumab. There have been about a half a dozen trials now that have looked at shorter durations of trastuzumab, six months largely. And um, they almost all look nearly as good, six months as 12 months. Maybe there's a smidge of difference, maybe like a 1% difference, but it looks like six months covers the lion's share of you know therapy. And yet it's been almost impossible in the United States, at least, to get people to use less than 12 months of therapy. That's quite similar to Australia, actually. We, we still do the 12 months. But talking about patterns of care and once things are, I guess, in the wide world of approved drugs, you know, the, the updated data for Monarch 3 came out at San Antonio. And this has been a, a bit of a bugbear of mine over the last 8 to 12 months when you know, pelbocyclib didn't show an overall survival benefit in a metastatic setting. In Australia, we've generally moved to ribocyclib in the first line from our perception. And now abemocyclib hasn't, while, while numerically very much had a, had a benefit in the metastatic setting for overall survival, statistically didn't reach their threshold. Now, I would love to get your thoughts on choice of CDK4-6 inhibitor, given the data that's now out and how you'd rationalize A over, let's say, B? Well, the first thing to say is this is an important class of drugs, um, and um, they are very much a standard part of our armamentarium nowadays. All these drugs, palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib, were studied in both the first and second line of endocrine therapy as part of their registrations. And the hazard ratio for progression-free survival with each of these drugs was incredibly consistent across the, uh, the numbers of studies that were done. In fact, I would gainsay you would never see uh, seven or eight large phase three randomized clinical trials looking at different classes of drugs that had the exact same hazard ratio to within a tenth of a decimal, uh, less than a, tenth, a hundredth of a decimal point almost, or a few hundredths of a decimal point. So really incredibly consistent clinical activity. Um, the, um, the studies, that, the drugs have never been compared head to head. So let me ask you a question. Based on what you know, do you think it would be ethical to do a study comparing ribocyclib versus abemocyclib versus palbocyclib? Based on the primary endpoints, I'd say yes. Okay. So if it's ethical to do that, then you don't really believe that there's that much difference between these drugs. And you don't really believe that there's one or two that have magical survival benefits and the other doesn't. And I'm with you on that. These studies were done in different parts of the world with patients who'd had different types of prior therapy, who got different post-progression treatment, who had different post-progression follow-up. 
to its credit, the investigators working with uh, ribocyclib have done long-term follow-up, and in a couple of their trials, particularly in patients who had de novo disease, but in others, um, they've shown that there is a survival benefit for including ribocyclib treatment, and um, other studies, including the ones with palbocyclib, have not shown that. They've shown trends in that direction. Uh, they have shown, and in fact, there was a poster on this at San Antonio that real world evidence, real world evidence, he's making, you know, quotes, gestures with his hands, uh, but from the Flatiron database here, um, suggested a survival benefit for using palbocyclib. Um, and the data that were presented at um, uh, San Antonio with abemocyclib, with the so-called Monarch 3, actually showed a one-year longer median survival, but because of the way the follow-up was and the numbers of patients, that did not achieve statistical significance. Um, there were two posters at ASCO this past year where um, grad students, st statisticians worked together, and they tried to look at all the published data and see was there a statistically significant difference in, say, the palbocyclib versus ribocyclib versus abemocyclib outcomes in those trials? It did not achieve what anyone would call a statistically significant threshold when you did those cross-study comparisons. So um, the data have affected U.S. market share. I mean, um, in this country, palbocyclib had about 85 or 90 percent of the market as recently as four or five years ago. I think it's down to about 40 percent of the market, um, the other drugs splitting the market. Um, and I certainly think that um, the, uh, the drugs are all interchangeable. They do have different side effects. Um, and, um, but I would love to see a, a study that compared these drugs head to head, and I think it would be very ethical to do that. And there are economic implications to this because palbocyclib, the first of these drugs to market, will go off patent several years before the others. And so uh, there will be a real financial difference in what it costs either the healthcare system or the patient themselves in terms of which drug gets used once that drug goes off uh, patent. So then an interesting wrinkle is that, um, as you know, the big late-breaking abstract at San Antonio was the Inova, uh, I know, Inova. Yeah, yeah. One, two, zero. It's I-N-A-V-O, one, two, O, uh, trial from Roche Genentech. And that drug that they brought forward was their PIK3CA inhibitor, Inovalisib, but they combined it with fulvestrant and palbocyclib. And um, one of the convenient things about palbocyclib is it does tend to be well tolerated, and they were able to combine the PIK3CA inhibitor with the um, CDK4-6 inhibitor. And they showed a very dramatic improvement in progression-free survival. And when you do the back of the envelope calculations, and here's where it, like, totally becomes non-scientific. But if you say, what's the, the median progression-free survival with the triplet, fulvestrant, um, uh, palbocyclib, uh, inovalisib, <laughs> I kind of work on pronouncing that drug. I need to go to some very lucrative scientific advisory board and learn how to pronounce the name <laughs> of that drug. Um, if you compare that primary progression-free survival versus, say, Fulvestrant plus palbo, followed by, say, fulvestrant plus capivacertib or fulvestrant plus alpalizib. I actually think the triplet outperformed the second progression time. So it's going to be a really interesting question to see if there's true synergy between these to, to use clinically. And uh, at the moment in Australia, Navo 121 is open, which is anavolisib versus alpalizib as monotherapy. As monotherapy. I'm pretty sure it's monotherapy. That's interesting. I give them credit for going head to head. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I think those are you know important things to, to do. I think one of the issues with some you know uh, uh, of the more recent um, drug approvals in the space, in particular the Capivacerta, you know it ended up uh, being a subset of patients from the study where the FDA gr uh, granted approval, and that same subset would in theory be candidates for Alpelisib, but that wasn't included in the comparator arm. So it's good that they're doing that. Yeah, it's really great. Moving on, because I think I could ask you about every trial that's known to man. Tell me, with the trials that you've been involved in in the past, and I say I know you're more of sort of the clinical base, what was one of the most pivotal trials that you've kind of engaged with over the last, over your career, and how that's influenced breast cancer treatment to date? Well, um, we were fortunate to have a small role in the soft and text trials. Uh, and uh, these are native to your country of they Australia are, are. with Prue Francis uh, and uh, Olivia Pagani in Italy uh, giving the lead, um, uh, 
And but those were wonderful studies to be involved with um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, um, a lot of them were developed under the tutelage or guidance, if you will, of Aaron Goldhirsch, who was really an extraordinary figure in the management of uh, breast cancer based in Milan. Uh, polymath, spoke multiple languages, a remarkable man who, um, you know, was really one of the earliest to recognize that breast cancer wasn't all one disease. It's now such a cliche to say that. I hate saying it, but it's not, well, all well, one size doesn't fit all, you know. Uh, and um, to his credit, recognized early that, for instance, the benefits of chemotherapy in the early stage would be markedly different in ER positive than, than ER negative breast cancers. And Aaron was way ahead of his time in all of that. And the trials that he and the IBCSG and subsequently the big worked on were, were all very far-sighted in that regard. So that was one very important part of it for me personally, because Aaron was a dear friend. Um, the second is that if you look back over the arc of the past 30 years of breast cancer treatment, 35 years, the single biggest mistake we've made has been to not maximize endocrine therapy in premenopausal women. So um, the early studies of tamoxifen, for instance, did not have the benefit of using estrogen receptor biomarker testing. And so um, we knew that tamoxifen clearly helped in postmenopausal women, but it was equivocal in premenopausal women as to whether there was benefit from tamoxifen. And the Oxford overview in 1990, which is a long time ago, but that famously said there was no benefit to tamoxifen for younger women, which was an error, not an error mathematically, but an error because we didn't have the ER testing to inform the idea. So that led to a whole decade's worth of trials where people were looking at chemotherapy versus endocrine therapy or not giving endocrine therapy at all to ER positive tumors. And of course, once we started testing for estrogen receptor, it cleaned all that up. But it was a huge mistake and unfortunately um, led to a decade where younger women were not appropriately treated in retrospect with um, endocrine therapy. The second is we've never until the soft and text trial, reckoned with the impact of ovarian function suppression. So there were all these older data that ovarian suppression by itself could prevent cancer recurrence. There were retrospective studies that women who went into menopause with chemotherapy did better than women who did not. Um, but people didn't want to do it because they were afraid of the side effects and they were afraid it was condemning women to perhaps the longer term health effects of estrogen deprivation. Uh, and, um, uh, and so again, a generation of trials went by where we did not fully uh, weigh the impact of ovarian function suppression. And to this day, we, we have problems with that because if you look at the Taylor X and the RX Sponder studies, which were beautiful NCI sponsored cooperative group studies where they use the Oncotype DX recurrence score to inform that decision about whether or not to give chemotherapy. As you know, there's a small signal of benefit for chemotherapy in premenopausal women, even with these lower recurrent scores, but they didn't factor in ovarian function suppression. So um, um, in, in retrospect, you gotta, you gotta say, well, that was, these are very important studies and not every study can answer every question, but in retrospect, that was a real limitation of the study for the younger women. So um, uh, my own belief is that ovarian function suppression is a very important part of treatment for medium to higher risk ER positive breast cancers. And so the SOFT and TEX trials were very important studies to ask that question. SOFT randomized patients to tamoxifen alone, tamoxifen plus ovarian function suppression, or an AI plus ovarian function suppression. TEX being a partner study, um, uh, ovarian function suppression plus TAM or with an AI. And the data have been pooled in various ways. As you may know, there was a third arm, there was a third uh, part to that study triptych, which was the per K trial. And that actually was Gold Hirsch's design. And it was maximizing the ovarian function suppression and then asking, does chemotherapy help on top of that? That study is now being done in the U.S. by the cooperative groups. And in 10 years, we'll know the answer. But um, uh, Aaron saw that already. It's just it never accrued that study. So um, I've you know, thought that was a very important contribution. That we were very pleased to have a small part in that study. Uh, credit to you know, really an international team of investigators. Uh, Long-term follow-up now presented out to 12 years. I think it's really the model of the best kind of breast cancer research. Well, as they say, prevention to an extent is always better than a cure. And that's what we're trying to do, prevent any further, I guess, recurrences for these, these women. Yeah. Uh, and 
moving on. So you mentioned, you know, chemotherapy, it's got benefit in the premenopausal phase. What do you see the role of chemotherapy in the next 10 to 20 years? You know, the world is changing. Oncology is changing. Yeah. Well, you know, um, when I talk to our fellows these days, they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe you give adriamycin to people. <laughs> It, it's not like when we they were developing adriamycin, they had a choice of, you know, trastuzumab versus adriamycin. Which do you want to give? Uh, you know, we rest uh, our activities on the shoulders of giants and those before us. And, um, you know, we move forward. And uh, as drugs get better and better, um, uh, we replace things. So, you know, when I was a first year fellow, Dana Farber did a huge number of um, autologous transplants for CML. That was actually the largest indication for a bone marrow transplant in, in our group at the time. And um, then imatinib or Gleevec came along and within like, you know, five years, that whole enterprise had evaporated uh, because it's not like they were doing transplants when they had Gleevec on the shelf. It just didn't work that way. So where are we? Well, you know, chemotherapy works. It is, uh, it is a sledgehammer approach. Um, and um, to this day, we rarely know why chemotherapy stops working. We know very little about resistance to chemotherapy drugs we give in breast cancer. But it's an incredible part of the backbone for a lot of what we do. We know that chemotherapy makes targeted drugs like trastuzumab work better. Uh, we know that chemotherapy remains critically important for triple negative breast cancer, even when you throw in checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab. Um, and we know that for some breast cancers uh, that are ER positive, chemotherapy is still going to be a very important part of the puzzle. I think that, you know, it's becoming commonplace to say that antibody drug conjugates will replace chemotherapy or at least displace many of them. I think that's true. They tend to have a, a slightly more activity in some, some instances. Um, but remember, ADCs are largely fancy chemotherapy. You know, if you didn't tell the patient that they were getting an, a brilliantly bioengineered macromolecule that has an antibody targeted and then a clever linker that dissolves in the right place and then a chemotherapy payload. From the patient's point of view, it's like getting chemotherapy. It's IV treatment, causes low blood counts, nausea, fatigue, hair loss, all those kinds of things. Um, and um, I think that, um, um, you know, if the drugs are better, they'll win, but otherwise it's a lot like giving chemotherapy. Um, you know, I've been in this long enough to say that the one thing that's really remarkably changed about chemotherapy administration is the supportive care piece and the development of uh, antiemetics, the development of growth factors have radically transformed, you know, what you could do with these chemotherapy drugs and how palatable it is uh, for patients. And I hope that we get to the point where we can do the same with um, some of the ADCs, because I think that's still a, a more toxic option in many instances than our existing chemotherapy options. It's interesting you bring that up. So a little bit of an anecdotal story. Back in the 1960s, my father worked at a repatriation hospital in Melbourne, Australia, as a nurse's aide. And he would say that, you know, the chemotherapy they gave in the 60s was more than likely to kill the patient rather than, you know, to actually extend life. And it was quite a traumatic and, you know, fundamental part of his upbringing, understanding that he didn't go into medicine. He, he became a teacher. I think it turned him off quite quickly. But it's interesting what you say, the, the changes over the last 30 to, you know, 30 plus years and where we're sitting at now. Do you have any tips and tricks for young investigators, you know, up, up and coming breast oncologists, aficionados, and sort of where you should see them putting their efforts in a real complex world where, you know, grants are becoming more complex, you know, sponsored driven trials are having huge influence on trial design and the world is becoming a lot more complex for breast cancer and many of the cancers that we treat. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I think that's a good problem uh, to have, obviously. Um, a couple of things come to mind. Um, one is, I think it's really important to see a lot of patients. Uh, I know that sounds cliche, but you'd be surprised how many investigators don't see that many patients. Um, you can always tell when they talk that they don't actually have that tactile, palpable feel for what the real world of caring for patients is. Um, so that's really important. The other reason it's really important is that breast cancer, even besides the familiar subsets of ER positive, triple negative, HER2 positive, um, breast cancer is an incredibly heterogeneous disease. You and I have had the chance to be in clinic uh, a day or so uh, this week. And you know, you'll know you see patients who have ER positive metastatic breast cancer where the cancer has 
been indolent for 10, 15 years, and you'll see other patients where you put them on first-line therapy and it progresses within months. Um, you will see patients who have early stage disease, 10 positive lymph nodes, and you're like, oh, for sure they're gonna recur, and they're free of cancer 20 years later. And you'll see patients who have node negative breast cancer, and you think they're gonna be fine, and two years later, there's a problem. So it's a disease that's very humbling, uh, and where you really need to appreciate the variety of both the clinical presentations and the clinical outcomes to understand the literature. It's, it's a very important thing to, to have a feel for. Um, you know, the second thing is that um, uh, it's, you know, there, there are different skill sets when it comes to being an investigator. Um, there are people who are really good at understanding drug company needs, market niches, uh, where to position drugs. And that's an art. You know, people who do that well can really be incredibly valuable. And the drug companies obviously lean heavily on those kinds of individuals. There are other people who are um, uh, very good at building teams. Uh, and so those people have historically done very well in the cooperative groups or the global cooperative groups like the big and all the other consortia that exist um, because that really requires swaying people over to your uh, point of view on what's an important study and, and what isn't. That's an art that takes years to develop and usually requires having very strong mentors uh, along the way. It's rare that a, you know, a young investigator just walks into the meeting and says, hey, I've got a really great idea. Why don't we try this? And everyone goes, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. The ideas in breast cancer, actually, everybody has the same ideas. Everyone wants to add a new drug to a regimen. Everybody wants to take away a toxic drug from a regimen and see if you need it. What's hard is to be in a situation where you can actually deliver on the creation of a clinical trial. And um, that re usually requires mentorship. It requires knowing the community of people. So going to the meetings, getting familiar with those individuals, hearing what they have to say, figuring out where they think the important questions are is really important. One thing that unfortunately is, is hard to do, but we need more of is true translational investigators. Um, there are very few people on earth who really can run a lab, take human specimens from tumor tissues, from blood, from other body tissues, and analyze them and link them to clinical outcomes. You can probably count on one hand the number of labs around the world that really can do that in a sophisticated way. And um, those people are, you know, the ultimate coin of the realm. That's a, a very rare skill set. Uh, but if you have it, or if you have access to working with people in it, it's a remarkable thing. And so, you know, I think of people like Shereen Loy in Australia, and Nick Turner in London, and, and several in the United States who have that capacity to do that real translational work. I'm not talking about sending your specimens to a company and having them run 100 things, but really having the capacity in a lab to do interesting correlative work and understand the science. That is a, a great thing to do if you have the interest and the opportunity. Fair enough. I have two more questions for you, and then I'll let you go and do all the other work you have to do. If there was one question that I, I had forgotten to ask you that you thought was important for this podcast, so anything about breast cancer or life, is there anything that you think I should ask? Well, I think that, you know, we tend to ask breast cancer questions that seem tractable, that are, you know, answerable. But there, um, there are a couple of things happening in breast cancer that make it hard or harder. So the first is that in the U.S. and Western Europe, Australia, other developed societies, we're really seeing a split in the early stage world. The vast majority of patients are having screen detected, low risk, early stage breast cancers with a recurrence risk probably less than five or 10%. And um, that's a huge public health problem. There's a whole operational piece, like how do you make sure they get their therapy and how do you make sure they get their follow up? We're usually not thinking about therapeutic innovation in those patients because we do quite well. We don't do perfectly, but we do quite well for those patients. And so making sure that the team comes together and does the right thing is, is really important. And the other half then, of course, is higher risk, more refractory or less successfully treated patients where there's a lot of innovation and drug addition and all these kinds of things. But that's only a small part of the puzzle or the pie of breast cancer in the United States. The second piece of it is that um, um, there are profound disparities in outcomes um, within a country, within a region, and certainly between countries in, in the world. Uh, you know, here in the United States, there are um, 
uh, outcomes differ by up to 30 to 40 uh, percent between states uh, based on factors including socioeconomic status, um, based on race, uh, based on ethnicity, things that are often very closely linked to socioeconomic status in the United States. Um, we could do so much better in terms of our national cancer outcomes if we addressed if we didn't have any therapeutic innovation but addressed all those gaps and uh, deficiencies. And it may be a little bit less pronounced in various countries in Western Europe, uh, perhaps in Australia and New Zealand. I, I don't know as much about that. I suspect some of the similar trends exist, but perhaps not quite as profound. Um, but then if you look at cancer in the developing world, um, you know, breast cancer is the leading diagnosis of breast cancer in low and middle income countries. Um, the numbers of women who are going to be affected by breast cancer around the world are surging in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Central America, Latin America. And, um, you know, these women are, are really looking at a very different disease than we see in the U.S., Australia, New Zealand. So at San Antonio, we had a, a debate on the role of anthracyclines. And um, in that debate, the person who said, let's get rid of the anthracyclines, said, oh, we don't need anthracyclines. We have all these great new drugs. We have pertuzumab. We have trastuzumab emtansine. We have pembrolizumab. We have all the CDK4-6 inhibitors now in the adjuvant setting for breast cancer, all this kind of incredible stuff. The role of anthracyclines above and beyond that is going to be negligible. And the person who argued in favor of anthracyclines, Martine Picard from Belgium, as it happens, pointed, you know, she actually had a brilliant slide. And she reported on her own country of Belgium. And um, Belgium has something like 11,000 cases of breast cancer a year and maybe 2,500 deaths from breast cancer a year. And then she contrasted that with Brazil, which has roughly eight times as many cancers diagnosed and roughly 15 times as many deaths. And then she had a table which listed all those drugs we were just talking about. Pembrolizumab available in Brazil? No. Adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitors? No. Uh, trastuzumab seen for residual disease? No. And those kinds of gaps, which are, you know, part of the profound disparities in economic uh, wealth across the world, um, are, are the big challenge. And if we could find a way uh, to address those and to make those kinds of treatments available to people, we would have a huge impact uh, on death from breast cancer all around the world. And um, I think that, and that's without any further innovation. Um, and there have been many, many pilot studies, for instance, to show that, you know, in cities in Africa, if you get the clinics, the drugs, and you get the patients to the clinics, the patients do every bit as well as patients in Europe and the United States who get the drugs. The problem isn't that there's something so different about cancer in these other countries. It's that they don't have access to these to these treatments. And that it can include radiation therapy. It can include even standard endocrine agents. So um, that's a huge, huge thing. And as it relates to breast cancer investigation and ties into some of the themes we've talked about, at a time when we're talking in metastatic disease about multiple lines of therapy, where you get treated is going to affect how many lines of therapy you have and what kind of supportive care. Um, you may have had the chance to visit clinics in parts of the world where they don't have very good palliative care, where they don't have very good pain management opportunities, where they don't have opportunities to do a thoracentesis or a paracentesis or offer palliative radiation therapy. And when you realize how different the care for metastatic disease looks in different parts of the world, you also begin to realize that when you're a clinical investigator comparing outcomes when patients got treated all over the planet, it becomes very difficult to do. So there's a big challenge there uh, and a big opportunity. Uh, and I think that it would be great if, um, if more oncologists and more pharmaceutical companies and more healthcare systems sort of stepped up to that challenge and um, you know, tried to make uh, uh, more of an impact there. Wow, very, very interesting. My final question yeah. is if you had any advice for your younger self, <laughs> whether that be personal, professional, in the oncology world, you know, you're, you're starting up in your career, what would that be? So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I did an MD-PhD in uh, immunology and I 
I, I joke when I talk to our fellows, I say, I learned two things in grad school. The first was I wasn't going to be a bench investigator. And the second was that I didn't really think the immune system had much to do with cancer, which was true for the first you know, 15 years of, of my career. Um, so um, I think that um, the, the biggest and most important piece of advice uh, is to enjoy seeing patients and um, you know, learn from them, not in a hackneyed sort of way, like we're going to learn from every patient by interrogating every tumor and things, but just learn from them, learn what it's like to be a cancer patient, learn what it's like to experience the disease, the treatments, and how that affects people and, and the nature of the disease itself. Um, the second thing, obviously, is you have to have a great mentor. And um, I was very fortunate to have Eric Weiner uh, in the breast cancer space, uh, who was really a wonderful mentor for me for many, many years. Uh, and, and he's served the same role for others as well. Uh, but that makes a huge difference in terms of both learning, but also getting connected to this global community of people who study uh, breast cancer. The third thing is that um, pick, a, pick something you're going to be the expert in and, and own it. So, um, you know, I think we, we talked a few minutes ago about the power of translational research. I think people who can do... Um, genomic analyses, who can run those kinds of correlative studies in the lab, very unique and, and very powerful skill set. Um, people who actually know how to do uh, uh, high impact data analytics and artificial intelligence are obviously going to be really important in the future. I and mean, this is the most obvious thing on the planet right now, right? But if you are someone who's interested in oncology and you're going to be thinking about AI, there are two ways to do it. One is you find a friend who does all the AI, which is great, but then you're totally dependent on that friend to do all the work. If you can learn a little bit more about it, it might mean taking some computer science courses or figuring things out or actually doing the work a little bit yourself, then you're going to have for the next 20 years the opportunity to contribute things which relatively few people are. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff like, oh, we sent all our things to this company or that company or we partnered with someone at MIT or Caltech or what have you. But um, people who actually understand that are going to be really rare and uh, really important. So that would be, that kind of skill acquisition is is really uh, a valuable piece to define yourself. Fair enough. Hal, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on, your, having you on this show. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to join you and uh, look forward to uh, more conversations. Thank you for listening to this episode of Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. If you like this episode, there's plenty more where that came from. Check out our website, inquisitiveonc.com, that's inquisitiveonc.com, for links to all of our previous episodes. You'll find links to our social media there as well. If you'd like a particular subject covered on the show, feel free to drop us a line on Twitter at inquisitiveonc or via email at inquisitiveonc at gmail.com. This has been Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, a podcast by ABC Productions.